need to do more. What better series to lead us into what we're going to talk about next month as far as building spiritual muscle and getting rid of spiritual fat than the idea that we've got to change. We've got to have a revolution. I know the, the sound was a little quiet this morning, but, but the video that I showed before at the first service was, was a video of, of, a, of a rabbi speaking to some of our congressmen. And, it, and it, in the, 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 the context of what he was saying was that when George Washington stepped forward as president, he said that if we separated God's will from our purpose, we would fail. And now we live in a society where we have pushed God out of our schools, we have pushed God out of our public square, and we are quickly and avidly pushing God out of our churches. And we are destined for failure until we get some men and, men and women that will stand up in a revolution and say, I believe in the living God, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I will not bow down to the enemy. We need a revolution. We've talked about this revolution all month. We've talked about the revolution of an individual. We need men and women individually to stand up and say, we're going to change things. We've talked about the revolution of the church, how that as a church body we need to stand up and say, we still believe in God. Today we're going to give the teeth to the revolution. We're going to give the teeth to the revolution. Last week we talked about how that our revolution has a war cry. Our war cry is, I am an, I, the spirit of the living God is upon me, and I've been anointed to preach good news to the poor. Uh, we have been called to share the gospel, but now we need some teeth. We need some power. It, when you look back at our country, there was a revolution. That revolution started in many ways. Many things happened. There was the Boston Tea Party. There was Paul Revere's ride. But what made the revolution powerful was not throwing tea into the harbor. It was not a man riding a horse saying the British are coming. It was not people sitting around in rooms and talking about it. But it was when minute men, men who are ready on a minute's notice, walked out of their homes with their muskets and their, their squirrel rifles and said, we're going to put teeth to this revolution. We're going to be willing to stand and fight for what we think is right. I've come by, oh, I'm a fired up this morning. I've come by here this morning to tell you it's time we quit hiding in back rooms and we step out into the public streets and say, I'm ready to fight for the power of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let me preach. I ain't started preaching yet. Hang on. I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning. Yeah. Boy, that's getting better every week. If you're visiting with us, you go, what in the world are they doing? We get excited when we open the Word of God. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14. This has been the cornerstone of this whole series, and today it will be the cornerstone of this sermon. It says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I come to you right now. Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for your power. Lord, I praise you for your anointing and your peace. And Lord, I pray that you would send your victory that you would send your anointing on this service. And Lord, I pray that you would let your anointing flow through me like it's never flown through me before. Lord, let me be, Lord, let me be in the front lines of a revolution. Lord, that changes the way we think, that changes the way we act, that changes the way we respond and allow us to stand up as a body together and unite in your power and in your name, Lord, to overthrow the voices of the enemy who is raising the power in our nation. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I began to look at this passage of Scripture. I began to look at what uh, is being said here. And, and this comes from Solomon's prayer as he's dedicating the temple. 
as he was dedicating the temple to the Lord, this was part of his prayer. And, and, and I love the way he lays this verse out because it gives us a picture, it gives us a drawing, it gives us a blueprint of how we can have a revolution and change our nation. How many of you are, 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 are satisfied with the destination of our nation? I don't see any hands. And if I did, I'd probably come pray for you. But uh, we, we, we live in a society where not only, as I said before, have we taken God out of, uh, not only have we taken God out of, uh, out of the schools now, we've taken God out of the public square, and we've taken God, uh, we're now effectively battling to take God and morality and truth out of our churches we have churches all around the country who have decided that homosexuality is acceptable, not because it's acceptable by the word, but because it's acceptable by the world. So instead of standing against what men say and living on what God says, we're standing up and saying, well, God is merciful enough to forgive us, so we're going to side with men so we won't be labeled as bigots, as, 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 as short-sighted. I've got news for you, church. I do believe that God created marriage to mean, be between one man and one woman. We live in a society where we think that the church is a place to hide. We have taken the power of God out. We no longer share our faith when we do, people look at us and say, well, you choose your way and I'll choose my way. I got news for you. God said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. You cannot get to heaven without Jesus Christ. I don't care if you believe in Muhammad. I don't care if you believe in Buddha. I don't care who you believe in. Jesus is the only way that will get you to heaven. It's not popular to say anymore. It's not popular to preach that sin is still sin. Let me tell you something, church. Things have not changed that much. We live in a day and age where things that were sins when I was a kid are not sins anymore. Come on now. I was part of fighting to change some of that. I believe legalism is wrong. I don't believe God cares how we dress except modesty. It's not the length of your skirt, the tightness of the tie tied around your neck. God says in the word that he doesn't look on the outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. But my fear is, in an attempt to get away from legalism, now all of a sudden we have opened up the can and everything become okay. That's why marriage inside the church has a divorce rate of 50%, just like it does in the world. That's why that they tell me that 50% of the people in the sound of my voice this morning have an internet pornography problem. That's not a world statistic. That's a church statistic. Why? Because we have decided that if nobody knows, it's okay. We have started applying the same principle that we always applied about gossip. See, we always justify gossip. Well, I'm just sharing. No, you're gossiping. Ain't no sharing about it. You're gossiping. I used to love people that couch it in a prayer request. They get in their little prayer group and they say, now we need to be praying for brother so-and-so because you know he blah, 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 blah. You know what? God don't need to know all the details. He already knows them. And he knows the truth. Your gossip is a sin. Your backbiting is a sin. Your slothfulness is a sin. I've come out here today to tell you we live in a world where we have separated the Word and God's Spirit 
and God's conviction and we've said that we don't need those anymore and all we need is to feel good. You see, what we're doing is quite biblical because Paul wrote it to Timothy and said, in the last days, people will not put up with sound teaching. Instead, they will raise up for themselves teachers and preachers who will preach what their itching ears want to hear. We have made our churches consumer products and if you don't like it here, you can go down the street. Well, I got Newton. I got news for you folks. If you don't like it here, you can go down the street. Did you really just say that? But yeah. Because when we got a lot of lily, lily livered, yellow back, weak spirited people who are more concerned about their desires, more concerned about what they want to hear, polluting our seats and bringing down our people. They're going to do nothing but squash what God wants to do. I'd rather you leave and let God move. Mm. I'm going to preach in a minute. So how do we start this, Pastor? Here's how we start it. One word, if. I love what he says here. If my people who are called by my name. If. He doesn't say we're doing it. He said if we would. Can you imagine if? I love Andy Griffith. There's an episode of Andy Griffith. And Andy Griffith, they start. He, 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 he's trying to get somebody to do something for him. And he goes, now, if, and if, and they interrupt. He goes, oh, don't, don't, don't interrupt me. You're interrupting my ifing. <laughs> we need some child, to men and women of God that will stand up and start ifing a little bit. Well, we, we need to if a little bit. If we would do some stuff. If puts the power, puts the responsibility back on us. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk about then. There, there is a computer thing, a, a computer program uh, called Excel, and in Excel, you can create an if-then cell. If something happens, then something else will happen. In our church budget uh, uh, that Sister Angela so loves, I created all these if-then things. And she says, I don't know how that works, but you need to fix that one because it's not right. It's an if, 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 if this happens, then that happens. A revolution in our nation is an if-then responsibility. If we do stuff, then God will do stuff. If we stand, then God will stand. But I got to tell you something about an if-then statement. If you don't, God don't. Mm, that just messed with somebody's theology. Because somebody's back here going, well, when God wants to do it, he'll do it. No, the word says, if you, then God. You have the responsibility. Don't sit there and say it's not your job. It is your job to do the effing so God can do the delivering. So if, if what? Well, if we humble ourselves. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Church, we need to humble ourselves. We have become such a prideful group of people, it's not even funny. They call that piousness. Bless God, I'm a Christian. Oh, you want to make me mad? I can tell you how to make me mad. It, it takes a little bit. Come up to me and say, do you know how long I've been here? <laughs> really don't care. <laughs> do you know who I am? If you really want that, now this one won't make me angry. This will make, just make me show you the door. Do you know how much I give? <laughs> give it somewhere else. Let me tell you something, church. We need to humble ourselves. You know what that means? We, 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 we struggle with even what that means in America. It amazes me. I, I, you know I have such a heart for missions. I, I, I just, I, I love it. it, it it's, it's becoming my, one of my passions. 
You know what amazed me when I went to Scotland this year? I think I one time I saw a Scottish flag. We were talking about it with some of them, and I said, you know, me and Anthony, when we went back for the camp, we were talking to some of the young people. We said, you've got to understand that, that pride and patriotism is huge in America. You can't turn a corner in America without seeing a big old American flag. And they're going, really? Like, yeah, businesses, you know, car lots have, you know, 200-foot flags hanging them. You know, really? See, in America, we have this pride thing. I, I, man, I got pride. I like America. I'm American. I, 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 I like to fly my flag. That one and that one. I'll preach about that flag later. But I, I, you know, we, we have this pride. Our pride is such a part of our society that we have brought it into the church. Mm. I carry my iPad now. But when I first started preaching, my mom and dad bought me a Thompson Chain study Bible. I love my Thompson Chain. That's what I used to carry. I called it my preaching Bible. That thing weighed 75 pounds. Back when I was young, I could carry it. Boy, I, I, I sat under people like Floyd Lahan, who when he preaches, he'd take his Bible and hit, boom, you know, on the head with his Bible. Ain't no, ain't no wonder people fell out because he hit them with a 70-pound Bible. Boom! Now, there ain't nothing wrong with the Thompson Chain Bible. I like it. But sometimes we carry that around as a pride as our flag. Look what I have. I have a bigger Bible than you've got. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. We've brought pride into the church. But here Solomon in his prayer says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You ever been humbled? You ever been around somebody that you knew was more important than you were? And you were humbled? And all of a sudden... Your words become sparse. I am a talker. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that. I talk a lot. But I've been in certain circles where my, my ego was humbled and I wouldn't talk much because of who I was with. I was quiet. Most of you know Anthony. Anthony talks quite a bit nowadays. But he was telling me the other day that he was walking across campus and he ran into... Dr. Paul Kahn, the president of Lee University. And, and, and this generation of students at Lee, he, Dr. Kahn was the president when me and Beth was there as well. He's been there for 25 years now as president. And, and he's, he's built that college, and, and, and he's been a great leader. Well, the students that are there now, they, you know, they're like, oh, that's Dr. Kahn. And Anthony was just telling me this weekend, we were with him, he says, anytime I run into Dr. Kahn, it becomes hard to speak. Why? Because he's humbled whose presence he's in. Whatever happened to us getting into the presence of God and being humbled by the presence of God? Since when did we have enough, so much pride that as I told my Sunday school class this morning, we spend more time telling God what he needs to do than being humbled enough to sit there before God and listen to what he's telling us to do? James puts it this way in James 4, 7 through 10. He says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Notice you have to submit before you can resist. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Until we learn how to quit telling God what we know. Until we learn to quit trying to show off to God. Until we learn to humble ourselves down in front of an all-powerful, all-knowing, living God. We will never find power. Come by here, church, to tell you the day of saying, God, I think you should needs to end. The day of telling God who you are is a day of, of years gone by. 
It is time that we humble ourselves. It is time that we lay ourselves down, that we understand that when we come into the presence of God, it doesn't matter if we like it. It doesn't matter what we want. All that matters is that we have been bought with a price, and his word is the final word. You want to know why we don't have victory in the church? You want to know why we struggle in the church? Because we, we don't have humility in the church. Last night when I got home, I began to watch a documentary on one of the first national news events I ever remember in my life. The horrible massacre in Ghana from Jim Jones. I heard tapes. as a man who lost all humility stood up and said, I am the one they call God. And some nearly a thousand people followed him to death because there was no humility. Church, I've come by here to tell you, we're going down a dangerous road. We're going down a dangerous road when we live our life without being humble. All of a sudden, we begin to look around our life and everything seems to be a turmoil and we don't understand why sometimes we need to look in the mirror and understand that we do, not, we do nothing with humility. And until we start walking with humility, God can't move. If we're going to have a revolution, then we have to humble ourselves. If we will humble ourselves, it will start the revolution. What else do we got to do? He goes on. And he says, if we will pray and seek his face, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Whew. Let me tell you about prayer. Statistics tell us that the average Christian, I'm not talking about the average American, I'm talking about the average Christian in America, prays less than one minute a day. Out of 1,500 people surveyed in a survey done in, I believe it was 2013 or 2012, out of 1,500 people surveyed, 90% of them, these were all Christians, 90% of them said that they read the Bible on a regular basis, but only 31% of them said that they prayed daily. If my people will pray. Church, I, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about prayer. I, I, I'm not talking about give your firstborn child. I'm talking about praying. I'm talking about talking to God. I'm talking about spending a little bit of time and saying, yes, I will pray told the Sunday school class this morning that I'm almost embarrassed because as I was preparing the sermon I thought man if I could get our church if I could get our church to pray five minutes a day and one hour a week not included in that five minutes but take some day that you set aside and say I'm going to pray an hour but daily I'm going to pray five minutes it'd be revolutionary I, it, it would change everything. But you know what? You know what's bad about that? I would be so excited if we did that and we would see change. But yet that's not good enough. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Why is it? That out of 24 hours a day, we can only give God a minute. You don't want to know how much time we give to TV. You, you, you don't want to know how much time we give to the telephone, especially nowadays. This week, me and Beth and Michael, we went to the Mall of America for vacation. I'm not a mall person, neither is Beth, but it was air-conditioned place to walk around. And we walked around the Mall of America over five miles we walked on two, or I walked. 
Beth Road. But anyway, something funny there. But anyway, I uh, walked around that mall, and you know how many times that I had to push Beth's chair to the side or step to the side because people were walking like this? We can't spend time talking to God more than a minute a day. But we spend hours on Facebook and on text messaging and on phone calls and watching TV. And, and some of us in this room, if I don't have eight hours to sleep, you don't want to be around me. But yet we only got a minute for God. If we pray. Church, I'm going to tell you, five minutes ain't enough. I am going to challenge you, though. I want to challenge you to pray one hour a week, and I want to challenge you to pray 16 minutes a day. 16 minutes? That's sort of an odd number. Well, number one, that'll help you remember it. Number two, that would give you one sixteen prayer. Romans 1.16 says, For we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you'll pray that much, you won't be ashamed of God's power. I am not ashamed. I don't think you'll stay there. I think you get used to praying 16 minutes a day. It'll be 30 minutes a day. And it'll be 45 minutes a day. And then pretty soon you're going to be walking and praying. And pretty soon it's going to be like your cell phone. You're just going to be walking around going, dear God, Jesus, I just want you to reach out to me. Man, I walk around that mall, and I'd walk by stores and say, God, save them or put them out of business. One of the two. I saw things, and I thought, man, I can't believe people have gotten that bad. But instead of complaining about it, we need to start praying about it. 16 minutes a day, one hour a week. Why well, is it one hour a week important? Because there needs to come a time. Some of you plan your calendar around a certain TV show every week. You need to plan your calendar around God. I can't do that then. That's my prayer time. And you turn off your phone and you pray. See, that becomes part of the seeking. Pray and seek his face. You know what seek means? That means to look for. Means to search out. When I used to be, when I was a youth pastor, probably could still do it with the adults if I did the right amount. But when I was a youth pastor and I'd teach on ask, seek, and knock, before we would get into our youth room for that night service, I would hide a twenty dollar bill in there, and I would get into my lesson and I would say, "Look, I've put a twenty dollar bill somewhere in this room, and whoever finds it can have it." Man, they were crawling on floors turning things upside down, had one kid pulling ceiling tiles out of the roof, trying to find that $20 bill. He was seeking it out. Now we all go, <laughs> yeah, if I told you there was a check for $500 hidden somewhere in here, some of you would be crawling on the ground, <laughs> namely me. <laughs> we know what it's like to seek things. But here, God speaking through Solomon says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. What happens if we start looking for God? What happens if we start looking for God? Can anybody still remember when you were single? <laughs> that was good. Chrissy goes, Yes? <laughs> yes? When I was single, I sought out the girls. I did. I looked for them. Everywhere I went, I looked to see if there was a girl there. Oh, there's a girl. Whoa. I'm happy. I was a bit of a flirt. Just a little. <laughs> My wife's going. It's a bit of a flirt. I knew how to look for girls. Back when I was a kid, there was a song came from a movie. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. I'm going to stop there. Do you know what? 
when we want God to do something, we start seeking in all the wrong places. We're looking in society. We're looking in political correctness. We're looking in other religions when all we got to do is seek his face. If we'll seek his face, if we will pray and seek his face, seek his presence. My wife has the most beautiful face I know. I love her face. I love her. I like to see my wife. And I can hear her voice on the phone. But I was so excited when we both got iPhones. And I can video call her now, and I can see her face. Sometimes. Usually she lays her phone down, and I can see the ceiling. But sometimes I can see her face. But even that doesn't do it until when I'm in Scotland or when I'm so, until I can come home and I can walk in the house and I can see her face. Then I'm comfortable. Then I feel the love. Because I've told you time and time before that my wife's eyes twinkle when she sees me especially when I've been gone a while. She's got them closed right now because she's twinkling right now. But her eyes twinkle. And when I see the twinkle in her eyes, then I know she still cares. Church, we need to seek God so that we can see the love and see the compassion and see the mercy in his eyes. We can read about it. We can talk about it. We're not going to understand it until we seek him out and see it. But if you'll look for him, you'll find him. You know what the Bible says? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open unto you. You seek it, you're going to find it. When we pray and we seek, it brings power. James, we just talked about this this last week in our, in our class. James 5.16 says this. Confess your trespasses. Uh, a one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed then it says this the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much the effective that means powerful real fervent which means all in are 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 excited are are compassionate or a passionate prayer of a righteous man somebody trying to do right avails, accomplishes much. If we will seek God and pray the prayer of a righteous man, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If we humble ourselves and if we pray and seek. But then there's another one. If we turn from our wickedness, Church, can I tell you, there's way too many of us who think we're humbling ourselves. We say we pray, we spend time praying, we say we're seeking God, but yet we make a conscious decision not to turn from our wickedness. Well, God's grace will cover me. It's just too much to give that up. God, speaking through Solomon, did not say if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face then. He said, no, to pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. You can't keep doing sin and expect God to give power. That means you can't keep gossiping. You can't keep backbiting. You can't keep having bad attitudes. You can't keep doing this and doing that. You can't, mm, you can't keep tearing people down with your mouth. You can't keep involving yourself with pornography. You can't keep doing the things you're doing that you know are not godly and expect God to give you power. Oh, well, this is the way God made me. God just gave me a critical spirit. Baloney! Amen. <laughs> God 
didn't give you a critical spirit. The devil gave you a critical spirit. God didn't call you to tear people down. God called you to build people up. James says, how can blessings and cursings come out of the same mouth? You can't keep, get bitter water and sweet water out of the same spring. I got news for some of you. There ain't no sweet water in there. Because all you ever hear is bitter. You can't have both. Church, some of you are going to say, Pastor, being tough this morning. No, I'm not. I could be tough if you wanted me to. I'm not being tough. I'm being real. We have some ifs to do. The reason why we don't have power is we're not doing this. We're not humbling ourselves. We're not praying. We're not seeking. Mm. Let me back up praying one more time. There are, what? how many people here today? 80 people here today. There are 80 people. And of 80 people, Sister Ann comes to me excited and beside herself today. Because eight people were at prayer last week. Praise God. What? What? A slap in the face to this church that should be. Only eight of us? I'll tell you the truth. You know what they better than a week before? Better than a normal week. That's why we're excited about eight. Let me tell you something. You know what they tell me? I've had an overseer tell me. I told all the pastors in his state, pastors, when you do a prayer meeting, if you can get 10% to come out, man, that's a praying church. That means 90% of them aren't. Come on, folks. We got some ifing to do. If we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek his face, if we turn from our wicked ways, if... If we see non-humility and we see people that don't pray and people don't care to look for God, then it only goes to prove, it only goes to, to assume that people are still living in their wickedness. If we want God, we've got to turn from our wickedness. I want you to notice this is in the if side, not the then side. This is not what God takes away from us. This is what we walk away from. Church, it's high time. We quit waiting for God to remove things from us. And sometimes we stand up and go, that's not good. I'm walking away from it. I know a young person who got on social media and saw some posts he didn't like and said, I'm done. It wasn't really spiritual. I mean, it was spiritual, but it wasn't really spiritual. It was part of the attacks on our church, attacks on, on, our, on our faith by the movement in this country to, that all of a sudden makes people like Caitlyn Jenner receive awards of courage. The dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. This young person who spent a lot of time on social media deleted every app off his phone that related to social media. Does that mean he's perfect? No, but he made a stand. I haven't made that stand. I, I, I'm still on social media. My circle of friends may be a little different than his was, but I'm still there. Still trying to use it as a ministry tool. But what I applaud is he come to a place where he said, I'm not going to feed that into my mind, and I'm going to walk away from it. Say something, church. What was the last thing you gave up for your faith? We don't even preach about fasting anymore. When was the last time we gave something up for our faith? When was the last time you pushed a plate back because you wanted to pray? When was the last time you turned a TV off? When was the last time you walked out of a movie? When I was flying back from Scotland, I put a movie on the seat back screen. 
And I watched about five minutes of it, and I said, I can't watch this. I turned it off. It wasn't nothing real bad, but it was bad enough. When was the last time that we turned from our wickedness? We can't get to the then until we do the ifs. If we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek his face, if we turn from our wickedness, then, oh, I love that one. After all the ifs, there always comes a then. Then, what happens then? Then, he will hear from heaven. God's not hearing my prayer, then you need to go back to the ifing. I just don't think God's hearing what I'm asking him. Then you need to go back. Are you humbled? Are you praying? Are you seeking his face? Have you turned from your wicked ways? Because he ain't going to hear you until you do that. Oh, now, Pastor, that's just rude. You're telling me that God, the most powerful God in the world, is not going to listen to me? No, because you're not on the right channel. I can talk all day long. All these, these, this video will wind up on YouTube. It'll be out there for the, for the world to see. And you want, you want me to tell you what's going to happen? 24 people are going to watch two minutes of it. It's out there. 24 people will watch two minutes of it. Why? Because it's not on the channel that they're going to try to watch. We spend a lot of time telling God stuff, but we're not on the right channel because we ain't been doing the ifing. But if we do the ifs, then he will hear from heaven. When we humble ourselves, when we pray, when we seek his face, when we turn from our wicked ways, all of a sudden we get the dials tuned in just right and Jesus goes, Oh, I hear something. God can't answer your prayer until he hears it, and he can't hear your prayer until you do your ifing. Then he will hear from heaven. Then he will forgive our sins. I just don't think God's forgiving me for this. It's because you're still doing it. You haven't turned from your wicked ways. But if, you humble yourself if you pray, if you seek his face, if you turn from your wicked, wicked ways, then he will forgive your sins. I've worried and fought and struggled with that my entire ministry. Why do so many people walk around with unforgiveness? Why do people say, I don't think God can forgive me? It's because I'm understanding it now. They haven't done their if and They haven't humbled themselves. They haven't prayed. They haven't sought his faith. They haven't changed. They haven't turned from their wicked ways. Then God will forgive your sin. He'll hear from heaven. He'll forgive your sins. And lastly, then he'll heal, heal our land. You want to know why America's in a mess? Because the church hadn't been ifing. We've become pious. We've become pharisaical. How dare the government attack the church? Why not? Every other government has attacked every other church in history. Come on. We act like we've got it bad in this country. Nero took the bodies of Christians and used them to light the garden, the pathways in his garden as he burned their bodies on stakes. That'll wake you up. All of a sudden, somebody on the news saying that we should accept something doesn't sound near as bad as Nero lighting us on fire. Church, I come out here to tell you, God wants to heal our land, but he needs us to do our part. God wants to bless you, but he needs you to do your part. You gotta humble yourself. You gotta pray. Look for him. You gotta turn from your wicked ways. We live in a day and an age in a society 
where we have accepted sin. We've just accepted it. Well, I'm better than most people. I don't do any big sins. I'll tell you something, there is no big sins and little sins. A sin's a sin. Sin's a sin. Murder and lying are the same thing. People don't like to hear that. Fornication and gossiping are the same thing. Jesus even said, sins of the mind and sins of the eye are as bad as sins of action. Jesus said, you have heard it said, man has sex outside of marriage. It's unlawful. But I say, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed the sin. I've heard it said that if a man kills a man, he's guilty of punishment. But I say, if you look at your brother with anger, you're guilty. See, folks, we've got to humble ourselves and understand. We can't do it without him. When you humble yourself, you understand, you can't do it without him. It becomes easier to pray and seek his face because now you're looking for the re- you're looking for the reprieve. God, I am nothing. I can't do this without you. And then it becomes much easier to turn from your wicked ways. Say, so you know what? I, I don't want to do that anymore. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn away from that. I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm going to turn the the phone off. I'm going to do whatever I've got to do. I've got to change whatever I've got to change. I love in the movie um, uh, Fireproof. The star of that movie has a has a pornography problem. His wife comes home one day and he's taking a ball bat and beat his computer up. He wouldn't have a computer in his house. Not because the computer was evil, because he couldn't use it for anything but evil. So he did what he had to do and he got rid of it. Do what you got to do, but get rid of it. Because if we'll do that, then God will hear from heaven. He'll forgive our sins. You know what forgiving our sins means? It means cast them as far as the east is from the west. And he will heal our land. He will heal us. Church, come by here today to tell you it's time. It's time you humble yourself time you pray and seek his face it's time you turn it's time you turn it's not popular preaching anymore it used to be the way we preached all the time but they used to say turn or burn baby turn or burn we don't say that anymore because oh, God's grace God's grace is there but we've got to do our part it's time we turn I'm going to pray a prayer as I pray this prayer, I want you to get the pride out of your life. First thing I want everybody in this place to do is humble yourself. Humility means you understand you're below God. I'm not talking about low self-esteem, but in this sense, I want us to quit telling God who we are and what our heritage is. And put ourselves on the ground as humans in the presence of an almighty God. Humble yourself. And as I pray this prayer, I want you to begin to pray, God, what do I need? I want you to seek him. God, let me see your face. Because in the light of Jesus, you see your problems. Tell everybody, when I went to Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida, back in 1999... Gave me a big orange sticker for my jacket. It said, guest pastor. But there was an anointing in that building that was so powerful and so strong and so bright that when that light was shined on my life and I looked at my heart, I saw things that I had never seen other places, and I saw them for what they were. They were sin. I was humbled by the presence of God, and I found myself standing at an altar with 
20 or 30 other pastors, all of us standing the same way, covering up our guest pastor badges, going, God, forgive us. Because when I began to seek his face and I got in his presence, I saw things I didn't realize were there. Because in my humility, in the presence of God, I could see sin that I never saw before. And then turn. As I pray this prayer, I want you to humble yourself. I want you to pray. I want you to seek his face. And if you see anything in your I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a council member, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a visiting minister. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've never been here before or you're here every week. I don't care. I want you, is have, as you look at your heart and I pray, if you see anything in there, I want you to turn from your wicked ways. And here's how you're going to do that. You're going to get up out of your seat and you're going to come to this altar. That act of walking down this aisle is the act of turning. Because I believe if we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek his face and we turn, when we get to this altar, we're going to find then. Then he's going to hear from heaven. He's going to forgive your sins and he's going to heal your land. As I begin to pray, I want you to begin to pray.